morning, good morning everybody. I think we're all here. Hello. Wave, Royal Wave. Uh, what else can I make you do? No, I won't. Okay, right, yes. Um, so, hello everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome to the first uh, FutureSync 2017. The uh, Plymouth's first multi track track. Multi-track tech conference with a twist. Um, so, I mean, first things first, um, I know we have all woken up and everything is a bit of a shambles this morning. Um, but don't worry, because we have got uh, some scones and clotted cream and jam, and I am absolutely sure by Tony that we are serving them the correct way around. <laughs> so there is at least one thing that will go correctly today, so that is always good. Um, so yes, firstly, thank you very much for joining us. We've got a great day planned. Um, it's a great opportunity for you to engage with the thriving digital community of the Southwest and become part of this vibrant gathering of technologists, creatives and educators, some of which you'll even get to hear from today. Um, the software design and development track is going to allow you to explore a diverse range of topics including user experience design, virtual reality, game development, creative coding and audio visualizations from an exciting speaker lineup that we've got for you today. Um, please someone remind me to tell Marina not to include so many long words in the next intro she might Because this is quite hard work. <laughs> so, um, finally we just need to let you know in your goodie bags, um, you've got the updated conference schedule and campus map which is going to help you find your way around today. So there's lots of different stuff going on all day in lots of different buildings um, across, the, across the kind of almost the whole university. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take you through a quick overview, overview of how the day on the software track is going to go. Um, first up this morning, we've got Christian Harmon, uh, Natalia <coughs> Vanacek, and Chris Hunt, who will become known long, uh, today as the man that you will not stop here. Um, our second session, we have got Ben Holiday, Mark Drew, Vicky Johnson, and Andy Mantel. Um, Andy's talk has uh, something to do with gerbils. Uh, sounds weird, but I'm definitely intrigued. Um, our third session just after lunch will be Sam Ray, Katie Good, and Craig Gerber. And then we are finally finishing up with the British Computing Society panel, which will be held in the Roland <coughs> Levinsky building, which is the big fancy building that's won an award for being the most ugly building ever created. I think. It's always fun. Um, so it's bringing all of the kind of day's themes together, uh, which is you know software, entrepreneurship, and business. Um, brings them all together, exploring how getting businesses, communities, and educators working together underpins long-term success for the Southwest tech industries. And then finally, the man that you will not stop hearing from today will be closing the FutureSync conference, um, talking about the the interactive installation known as Loving Grace. Please make sure you pronounce that correctly uh, when you tell people about it, because if you pronounce it wrong, it's really dodgy. Um, one final thing. There's a very handsome, attractive gentleman at the front of the building there. A front of the building, front of the room. If we want a good after party, after future sync, this is the man to speak to today. Tell him how much you're enjoying the conference. and generally make him feel very happy. And I have it on good authority. We'll have a better after party. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. Excellent. I think he's very handsome. <laughs> and I mean, I'm sure you'll all agree. So, from about 11:11:30, 11, 11, which is the second break, the exhibitors will be um, open in the Davy Main Hall, uh, which is the kind of North Hill entrance of the university. If you go from there and you go left, they're in there. There's plenty of signage to get you in there. There's lots of different kind of tech demos, lots of cool stuff. There's a weird looking bondage video game thing in there, which I'm very excited to try. Um, it'd be nice to have a story about strapping myself into something I can tell my parents. Too hard? Four to ten, it's fine. Um, and in very, in, in very exciting news, the IVT Theatre is going to be open over lunchtime. Um, so, if you don't know where that is, again, there will be plenty of signings. There's plenty of people who need food sink t-shirts if you need to know where to go to get to all this stuff. Um, it's definitely a worth uh, a go in there for that over lunchtime. Um, we also have the Future Sync app that's available for download. It gives you a kind of uh, a breakdown of all the speakers 
and the, the layout of the day. This one is the this is the next one. Probably the most important thing for the day is your Wi-Fi network for the day. So if you search for the Wi-Fi network with Plymouth, um, it's free all day, but you've just got to give away your personal details uh, to get that Wi-Fi access, and then you'll be logged in all day whilst you're up here. Um, and then I believe we are looking at the social media for the day. Please make sure any kind of pictures and tweets and stuff like that that you do, please make sure you at uh, the FutureSync comp and hashtag FutureSync17. Um, the other thing to remember, there is a second track, which is known as track two, and I would like us to troll them really hard all day. Tell them how much better our track is than theirs, and generally uh, give them a lot of grief and abuse, because I have promised that I will do that. So I'm relying on all of you to help me. Um, and then finally, we need to say thank you to the sponsors and partners that have uh, helped us make the day reality. Um, they again will have spawns that spawns. There are stands all outside in the building out there, in between here and the Plymouth Conference Theatre, where there's lots of details you can see about all the stuff that they do. And of course, all the partners that have helped us kind of bring this event together and uh, get it to where we are now. So, <coughs> without further ado, and no more uh, borderline offensive jokes from me. We're going to start the first session with our first speaker, uh, Christian Harmon. Earrings, long curly hair, sound engineers love me. Like six or seven microphones from other conferences still somewhere in there. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, uh, enough for the borderline offensive jokes, let's go to the fully offensive ones. Um, I'm here today uh, uh, because uh, I got invited to speak about a, a machine learning and artificial intelligence to you. And it was quite fun because today is the day of conferences. I was asked in September, I think, to be here, so I said yes. And then over the year, uh, over the month until then, there's eight different conferences happening today that wanted me to speak as well. So I was like, what, what is it with 9th of June that everybody wants to do a conference? This is super bizarre. And then I come down here from London. I came yesterday from Amsterdam, from an, uh, where I gave the keynote at another conference. And then I flew into London took the Paddington uh, train, the Hesper Express to Paddington, took the Paddington train to here. And uh, I'm, I'm talking about machine learning, artificial intelligence. And I arrive here, and I get out of the train, and the person like, oh, you, don't, you didn't print out your ticket. It's not on paper, so we can't let you leave the train station. <laughs> and I'm like, I should replace you with artificial intelligence, or some sort of intelligence. You know, it would be very, very useful for everybody involved. So uh, today I want to talk to you about the topic of machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence, but don't worry, I'm not going to talk about it in detail because you can look that up in papers and in all kinds of things, and if that's a market that you think about, please do. This is the market where everybody's hiring at the moment. This microphone is really annoying, isn't it? But okay, I'm loud enough as it is. Um, I want, us, I want us to think about more of machines as helpers and more of these information systems as helpers for you to build interfaces for humans. But let's start at the beginning, uh, uh, or before the beginning actually, about visions of the future. Uh, what do all these men have in common? So this is George Orwell, this is Arthur C. Clarke, this is Aldous Huxley, and this is not a, a Christmas impersonator by Ellen Moore. <laughs> They're all white, they're all grumpy, they're all English, but that's normal. <laughs> and they all, uh, and weirdly enough, Aldous Huxley was the French teacher of George Orwell, and I just learned that the other day. It's just really bizarre that two of the writers that I always cared about a lot are actually connected. So all of these are dystopian writers that wrote a long time ago how technology is going to make our life miserable, and governments are going to make our life miserable, and how everything will go wrong if we believe too much in technology and in control and in snooping on people and in recording data. <coughs> and uh, George Orwell is probably the most known one. And when it comes to machine learning and artificial intelligence, everybody keeps talking about his book, uh, 1984. 
And uh, Alan Moore's V for Vendetta is another one that is coming up more and more and actually became more known because of the movie as well. You know, you've probably seen the Guy Fawkes masks running around and people like doing anonymous things. And what is interesting is when you buy a Guy Fawkes mask to fight the system, you're actually paying money to Warner Bros. because they got the copyright of these masks. <laughs> it's quite bizarre to fight the man by giving him money. I don't know. But 1984 was a novel that was really scary. It was, uh, a, it was a government that took over feelings, that took over words, that didn't allow you to speak anymore, and controlled every media out there. They controlled the media by giving you an outside enemy to be afraid of, and, to, uh, uh, and kept pointing at that to keep people under control until like, we're the only one that can actually keep you safe. V for Vendetta is the same thing, where you've got a fascist state in England that, uh, that controlled people by controlling the media and only having one uh, source of news and not allowing people to be in the street and be publicly available. And when you think about it, in our enlightened times, and it was uh, uh, Tim Berners-Lee's birthday two days ago, we have the internet. We have the internet, a distributed system that is not owned by anybody. It's like where the human knowledge can be accumulated and has been accumulated over the years. So when you look at like what 1984 and V for Vendetta is about, it feels weird that everybody, that anybody thought any government would ever stoop down to try to control any of these. Because <laughs> in our enlightened times, that obviously is unthinkable. <laughs> now, Arthur C. Clarke's 2001 uh, was another uh, seminal point in TV and movies, and in this case, a book. Uh, but the movie made it much more known because uh, uh, Kubrick did a great, great job with that movie. And it had this uh, sentient computer in it, this HAL 9000, this robot that controlled the whole spacecraft that people were on, and then went haywire. And when it went haywire, it started killing or started try killing the humans around him. And uh, it became this very uh, uh, dogmatic way of running the, the, space, uh, the spacecraft, and people were just trying to get away from him. And they couldn't because they, he controlled everything. He was all over the place, he was always omnipresent and there was no way to hide from it. In this scene, they're actually in, a, uh, in the pod and try to see if they can actually do something to shut the computer down without it knowing it, because it cannot actually hear it because there's no microphones inside that pod. Um, I, the iPod was actually named after that thing. That's where it came from as well. And the great idea of them was to basically say, if the microphone can't hear me, then there's no way the computer can actually know what we're doing. But when you look at the movie, it actually starts lip reading. It looks at the lips of people and finds out what they're saying that way. Of course, this is science fiction. Nobody can do that kind of stuff except for Google's DeepMind, which just released an algorithm that can lip read at a 36.8% success rate, whereas a normal human lip reader can read 12% success rate. So wherever we try to hide from computers, it's over. We cannot hide from computers anymore. We've been recorded, we've been taken, we've been there. And it's always funny when people are like, oh yeah, we gotta make sure that we can't get recorded on that. Every time you've been to a train station, every time you've been to an airport, every time you have been somewhere, your biometric data has been recorded. And we hope the data is actually safe and somebody controls it. I sound like a, 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 somebody who's afraid of governments and who's afraid of these kind of things, like conspiracy theorists. I think there's one flaw with conspiracy, conspiracy theories they assume governments to be able and to be uh, to know what they're doing. <laughs> and these are humans as well. They make the same mistakes that we do. It's like a lot of times we connected all this big data and we were like a dog running after a car. If you caught it, you wouldn't know what to do with it. But we have all this big data now. And we're like, okay, now we do something clever with it, maybe. Or not. Or we leave it on trains like the CDs back then with all of our data. <laughs> Now, uh, Aldous Huxley was probably the darkest of them all, uh, and one of my favorite books, uh, Brave New World, was by him. And he said that technological progress has merely provided us with more efficient means of going backwards. And to a degree, he's actually true. I mean, nowadays we have these really, really cool portable machines in our pockets where we can 24-7 educate ourselves. We can send people nice messages and make them feel good. We can actually take pictures of beautiful things and send them to each other, and we use it to bully each other. And we use it to read hatred and to, to, to use machines to actually be horrible to other people. And I find it so sad that this education that came into that, all the, the ingeniousness that went into that, is used for that nowadays. When I see what, uh, what, what Brexit
Brexit was using social media for and what Trump was using social media for, they're better at that than we are. And this is not good. This is not good when, a, uh, when an algorithmic news timeline is controlled by people to sway your political opinion rather than giving you uh, insight into from all the sides. Now, Brave New World was a really scary uh, a few, uh, uh, image of the future because people were bred into certain uh, roles. You were basically, you were an alpha, beta, or delta, and the deltas were there to actually uh, uh, do all the menial tasks, and the alphas were there to only entertain themselves. Entertainment was given by the government. You had to actually entertain yourself, and you had to be promiscuous and all kinds of things. It's a very interesting way of thinking that like, the people who have things use them to entertain themselves, and the people who don't hope they get some job to make enough money to get into that level where they can get to this level of entertainment. And when I see the prices of mobile phones, and I see the prices of entertainment systems, this is where we are right now. And this is worrying to me that the, in, uh, that the technology that we have is not as distributed as it should be. What, uh, what he predicted as well is that people are thinking that they are in a certain space and they get forced to stay in that certain space. And I find that a lot when I talk about computers, machine learning, artificial intelligence, people are like, oh God, that's, that's clever stuff. I will never understand it. I, will, I, I don't want to touch computers. They're scary to me. My dad's a coal miner. My mom's a housewife. My brother's a fireman. My whole family has always been like the working class people because they, from the very beginning they've been told, you're working class. There's nothing you can do. If you don't have a degree, we can't afford going to university, so we're not going to be anything else. I said, stop that. I basically went out there and basically taught things myself. Back then, there was no way of learning web development and programming for the web, so I just learned it myself and wrote books and gave that out to the world and realized there is a way to move between these different social classes. But we still have the computer illiterate people, and we have like a, a digital a feudalism almost, where it's okay if the 2,500 pound laptop of this month is completely incompatible with the 2,400 pound laptop from last half year. And this is just driving me nuts. Like, this is pure consumerism that we shouldn't be in anymore. What uh, other people haven't predicted as well is that instead of having cameras by the government that spy on us in every corner and people with microphones sitting in there, we bought the machines that spy on us. We bought the cameras that we recorded all of our moves. We bought the things that we put in there. We take free services and give them our personal data and our browsing data to get into those. So they can profile us, they can make stuff up from us, and sell it to advertisers. So the HAL 9000 is actually in every house right now, if you think about it. And this is like Google I.O. and our keynote and everybody in the last few days was all about like, how do we actually allow people to make all these cool machines that they have talked to each other? How can my laptop talk to my self-driving car and my, my fridge and my dog collar or something? And you're like, this is the problem we're solving with technology? You know, cancer is still an issue we have to fix. You know, there's like not enough people with food all over the world. That might be something we have to fix. Going to other planets, of course, the way we treat ours is probably something we want to fix. And this is where I see myself, because if you think about that, five years ago, before Alexa, before Siri, before Google Home, uh, uh, what if I told you, you know what, do you want to pay a lot of money for a microphone that's in your house and records everything all the time? You probably would have said no, because you're like, but okay, cool, now I can buy things I don't need by telling a microphone that is somewhere that I need it. <laughs> this is what we're doing right now, and it's really bizarre that we this convenience is being sold to us as something amazing. But I don't know where the recording goes, I don't know when that thing is doing something, and I don't know where the data goes as well. It's kind of weird. But I'm not that kind of guy. I like the future. I like technology. I think computers are there to do our bidding. And we're not there to actually be the slaves of computers. I always love it in like science fiction movies when uh, uh, Total Recall, it's one of my favorites, but you got robot police officers in the street, and the humans are working in factories building robots. This is totally the wrong way around. You know, like robots are there to build other things for us. We're not there to build robots and then be them to be our police officers. But that's how Hollywood makes these things. The same way when you got a Terminator or something, they always kill it by ripping a cable out at the back here. You know, if I build a killing robot, I would not make it give any flaws that humans have. Like, you would have to find out how to kill that thing, not like do the same thing like you do it with humans. 
We got Boston Dynamics for that, so that's all right. <laughs> now, what I think computers are already used for, and especially machine learning and deep learning is used for, is that we have creature comforts we all enjoy and we don't know yet. We actually don't realize just how much of that stuff is in day-to-day -day systems that we're using on the web and it making our life easier. So, what are computers and machines for? What can they do for humans? First of all, they can prevent us from making mistakes. They can do boring, repetitive tasks. They can fill gaps in information. They can remember and categorize for us. They can make us understand better. And they allow us to com communicate more. And they can protect us from harm. And this I think we should use computers for. And this is what we're already using computers for, but not enough. Instead of we're like, oh, we gotta have some entertainment things going on, or we gotta, my favorite is the dash button, an Amazon dash button, I once saw it in a toilet where you can order toilet paper. You're like, how is the drone gonna deliver that? And will it be in time, is my other question. <laughs> I'm going to talk to a fashion company soon, and they're going to have thousands and thousands of photos about recognizing different parts of clothing that is probably not in our data set, so they will actually use these deep training algorithms and APIs to get their own information in there. We did this with kids. We interviewed kids about their favorite books, and then we ran it through speech analysis, speech to text, and this came out of it, which is just garbage. Translate banana dogs, guys, to get, doesn't make any sense. But then we told the system with Chris, which is the Custom Recognition Intelligence Services, uh, that it is about kids' books, and gave it shitloads of kid books, kid books to go through. And then it realized giants like banana jokes. Gus the Giant also likes riddles about bananas. For some reason, giants don't like songs about bananas. So by giving the computer context and giving it lots and lots of information, the information came out in the end. And this is what deep learning is all about. The good news for us is that we can now use these findings to build better interfaces, and I want you to think about what you can use these systems for. So here is, the, uh, here is my call to you to use uh, these APIs, and we can talk about them where you can find them. It's cognitive services from Microsoft, it's TensorFlow from Google. They all have their APIs for you to do, but do some good with them, because the machines of today, the interfaces we build today, <coughs> do train people of tomorrow. I love this one where it's like, okay, this is a video problem there, and you're like, okay, how do I get my credit card in <laughs> And we laugh about it, but then you try to get a Stanston Express ticket, and this is what it looks like. Because nobody ever tested that with a flaky mouse or like with a, with, a, with a touch interface, and there was like, every time I tried to reach the thing I wanted to choose, it went away again, which is very frustrating. But these are the interfaces that we're building without understanding that humans make mistakes. Make sure that you work for human error in your interfaces, and then you will build things that people are happy to use. It's time to, for us to build better human interfaces. If you haven't looked at it yet, we released a, a, a white paper and a workflow and a design system about inclusive design. I worked in accessibility for a long time, making IT systems available for people with disability, and I always hated that we used a disability as a means of like forcing people into thinking about it. Like, okay, there's blind users out there. If your website doesn't support them, you can get sued. And if I tell you, you can get sued, you try everything not to get sued. You're not thinking about the human. You're not thinking about making it usable for the blind person. But you think about like, what do I do so I'm not a bastard? So uh, there's no such thing as a perfect user. Think inclusive. It's allowing access, not uh, but avoiding barriers. And this is what all the information is about that we have in there. So for example, I love this little, uh, 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 this little Viking dude here. That's about a non-native speaker that basically cannot understand you what you're doing. Or we have this, this person here. Uh, 20,000 people in America have one arm. So building an interface for one armed person just because of 20,000 people makes no sense. But everybody who's holding a baby is also a one-armed person. So out of a sudden, this interface is much more usable for millions of other users out there as well. So think about ability as a, a disability as a sliding scale, and think about disability as an opportunity to make interfaces that are better for everybody else. So a deaf person or a hard of hearing person is the same as like a, 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 as like a cocktail waiter who's in the middle of a loud bar. They need the same interfaces. Subtitles are not only there for the hard of hearing, Subtitles are there for you to basically sit in a pub and see if something on television is important to you right now. I learned English by watching movies with subtitles. We dub television in Germany, which is friggin' awful. That's why German pronunciation and grammar is most of the time awful for people. We all sound like evil scientists. 
Most of us are, but we just sound like it. And, and the only show that I watched when I grew up was Monty Python. That was the only one that was not that was subtitled and not translated or dubbed. So that explains a few things. But it's very important to consider that, like, by keep learning a new language, subtitles are a wonderful thing for doing that. And especially uh, closed captioning is a very good thing as well because you even see like the names of the songs that are used in movies. So you don't have to use Shazam to film from your TV to find out what the song was. So think about, uh, uh, think about disability as an opportunity for hardcore testing your interfaces. And this is where natural language interfaces and this is where facial recognition and all these things come in. So our job right now is to create interfaces that are simple, human and fun to use. So what can we do with technology for us and our users? The same things that computers are doing for us. Prevent mistakes before they happen, do boring repetitive tasks, fill gaps in information, remember and categorize, allow for better understanding, offer new ways to communicate, and protect us and our end users. And I'm going to show you some APIs right now and some ideas how you can do these things. First of all, prevent mistakes before they happen. I'm so tired of new developers coming into our space and people telling them, you need to use the command line, then you need to use some text editor that you need to customize to the nth degree, then you actually have to use the developer tools in the browser and understand them to start building things, and then you basically put the kitchen sink on top of it before you even start <laughs> developing something. When we write in Word or Pages or whatever you use, we get told when something goes wrong. This is called linting, and ex editors have that. I just uh, had a course where I taught high school kids in America from ethnic backgrounds that are not normal in IT, uh, and we, we, we wanted them to get the, hit the ground running, so we use Visual Studio Code. I work on the Visual Studio Code team, so I actually I built this thing for free, which is pretty cool. And it's actually Google's, uh, it's Google's browser, it's GitHub's packing system, it's some stuff from Facebook and Microsoft's editor to, together. So all these companies are throwing things together, this open source cross-platform written in the language that I write it with. So that's kind of weird. But it, it, it does things like you run over an HTML element, and it tells you what the element is. It teaches you, while you're coding, what you're doing. It has a terminal built in. It has GitHub workflow built in. It tells you when your CSS is wrong before you even save it. And this is much, much easier than writing a lot of code and going to the browser and finding you had a mistake, going back, do a build process, see your build process failing. Stop. Uh, stop mistakes before they happen, so that's a really good thing to do. If you want to learn more about that, there's a great video, an introductory video to what Visual Studio Code can do for you. And this is not a sales pitch because it's free, but I just, I'm tired of bad editing. I'm tired of too complex development environments. And I'm, I'm, I'm very much tired of having to download five gigs of IDE to actually use a Unix command on Mac, for example. Do boring, repetitive tasks. Turning text, uh, turning images into text is not fun to do. You don't want to uh, have this open and type it in. So OCR APIs give you that kind of stuff. They tell you what the text in an image is, and they tell you what the language of the text is, and where the texts are in the image. So don't do that by hand any longer. Just use an API for that. It costs two pennies to use them with lots and lots of stuff. Uh, thumbnail generation. Anybody who is using Photoshop or is a designer in a company will have to do some thumbnails sooner or later, and it's the most boring thing on this planet. So in this case, a stupid thumbnail generator will just resize the image, and then you have lots of blue and some, some blurry thing in the background, you don't know what it is. So this one would be a cutout, for example, not a full resize. But it's actually more interesting if you realize there's a face in there, and you automatically center that one. And even better, you do a high profile, a, a high contrast version of that one, you detect the outlines, and then put the outlines in the thumbnail. This is something you can do in Photoshop, where you can do as a human, or you can make an API do that for you. There's Cloudinary, there's ImageX, there's, uh, they're all based on Microsoft's uh, backend, but you can use Microsoft backend as well. Google has those as well, Facebook has those as well. Automate your image processes that are really, really boring. Cloudinary even gives you a URL. So you have a URL here saying like uh, image upload C fill R16 by 9. Give me a 16 by 9 image uh, with 640 pixel width of that uh, picture that I uploaded. So it's coming from a CDN from different servers for the end user closest to them in the format that you want it to without you having it to upload to all the servers and keep them in sync. Fill gaps in information. Uh, this is the Vision API from, from Microsoft. Google has a similar one as well. That realizes here's a man in water. 
and it gives you the information about it. It says like water, sports, swimming, pool, confidence, uh, and the confidence levels of each of those. It says if it's a JPEG, it realizes the images <coughs> and the colors used in that JPEG, and it found that person in there as well. So you get all the information of that image just by pointing it to an API and getting the data set back. And you can batch automate that with things. You also realize if a picture is racy, if a picture is uh, adult content, which might be a good idea to think about as well. Of course, video is much harder to do, right? Not really. Video is just a stream of images. So what you do is you cut it out every 50 milliseconds, you do another image, and you do the image analysis on that one. This is videobreakdown.com, uh, and this is a video of a demo of Christopher Nolan, where he basically says, like, okay, here's like five minutes of my videos and stuff. So what it does, it gives you a transcript of the video. That's nothing new. YouTube does that as well. Another uh, video services do that as well for you. And it's editable as well, so in case there's mistakes in there, you can edit it easily. But it also recognizes all the different people speaking in the video and tag them. So you can then just say who these people are. And uh, if they're celebrities, it automatically pulls in an image and biography and these kind of things. If they're not a celebrity, you have to name them. But then you can navigate a long video by who spoke when. And also interesting, uh, uh, it also does an analysis on the sentiment. So it realizes when, the, when is the video negative, when is it positive, when is it actually neutral. And it created some, uh, some tags where people talked about them over and over again and realized that this information is in there. So video is not a dark uh, box anymore. Video is as approachable as everything else. And how cool it is, to, is it to have like a lecture at university when you have different people on the panel that we do later on and you only want to see the video of me talking because obviously. <laughs> and then you can click on my name and you've got a video only from me. We just released Story Remix at, um, at Build. That was really mind-blowing. If you haven't seen this video yet, uh, we can look at it later somewhere in a break. It's, uh, it's basically a football match of kids and 10 parents filmed with 10 different cameras or mobile phones. And then it made a video out of that one. And it recognized the different players. And when you said, like, I only want to have a video of my kid, it re-edited the video according to only where that kid was playing. When you dragged another, mu another music in, it changed the speed of the video to match the beat of the music. And then it allowed you to drag in 3D objects to map onto other things. So when she shot a goal, it put like a, a, a meteor on it, made like a big explosion, and made it really, really cool. All of that in the browser with just uh, some in-between editing. So video editors are soon out of a job, and it was quite interesting to see. And quite scary how cool that has become. Now, uh, remember and categorize, we talked about before finding content in images, like when I used Google, uh, Google Photos. A very important part is facial recognition. So facial recognition is not only important to recognize people, but also, as I said, to center an image, for example. And our API gives you uh, up to 22 faces in one image. And it gives you not only what the, uh, what the, that there are faces in there and an ID of them, but also gives you all the angles, like the left, top, bottom, these kind of things. So you can actually find out if somebody's sideways, if you want to put some, some glasses on them, or if you want to put things, uh, uh, put information on them. I did an interface where you have to shake your head to actually play a game that way because it just could recognize my eyes, what it was doing there. So that was pretty nice to see as well. So, and this is kind of like, we recognize a face, we give you a hash, and then you can reuse that. So that's a very important thing to think about when it comes to, uh, when it comes to login system as well. Why do I have to type in my password in, in 2017? People use password one, two, three, or basket, basketball or something like that. It's just very hackable. My biometric data, not so much. Uh, Google Hello, when I use my uh, Surface Book, and I keep looking at my MacBook as well, which is, doesn't have it, has like three cameras in it and an infrared camera. So it's not only a picture of me would do it, it actually has to realize that I have a pulse and I'm alive. So when I'm dead, you cannot use my head to actually log into my computer. <laughs> So the faces are there with all the angles that you can have, and then you can start saying, okay, uh, we know from this kind of distance and that kind of thing, that's probably a child, that's probably a woman, that's probably a man. So you can categorize them and actually pull them together into clusters automatically without having to do that, dragging it into different folders. That's a very good way to make a database of images of your company or an image database that you have and make it much more findable. Allowing for better understanding is basically uh, re emotion recognition. So we got emotion recognition on images, we got it on audio, we got it on video, and uh, we, we, we can do amazing things with that. 
Uh, first of all, for image recognition, of course, it's clustering images again according to those. When we do user testing, we have a camera filming people using at the website, and we realize when they start frowning, when they get happier, when they're actually doing things. So we, we have an emotion graph of when they surf through our products for user testing, not only the interviewer sitting next to them, but that can back up some of the assumptions of the interviewer and user testing. It's important, especially for uh, common systems. If you have common systems where you get like uh, booking.com, for example, got like 600,000 a day comments and stuff, you want to actually realize which are the ones who are most pissed off or who are most happy. Because these are the ones who are the most, they're waiting immediately for an answer. So the most unhappy customers are the ones that should go high up in your CRM system so people can actually type something to calm them down. And a machine can go through like 600,000 in like two seconds. Uh, humans would not be able to do that. So we got to find out this kind of information. We've got eight different things that, uh, that you can find out in information. Anger, contempt, disgust, fear, happiness, neutral, sadness, and surprise. It's really hard to do in Finland because they look the same every time we do any of those. <laughs> but we just, did, uh, we just did, for example, in the, in the Berlin office, I did a smile to get a cappuccino, frown to get a tea. And uh, people did it and were like, this is cool, it's pretty nice to actually work on these APIs because then your engineers have to show emotions as well, so it actually makes the interactivity between the team better. And this of course offers us news with new ways to communicate. We can actually use uh, voice recognition, we could use gesture recognition, we can use uh, audio output, generated audio, and we can use touch interfaces and all these kind of things. These systems are available for us and have been trained to recognize different things from people already. So somebody who can't move their hands just using facial, uh, uh, different facial uh, emotions to exercise, to go through a system, that's pretty amazing if you think about it. Of course, once you have uh, 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 facial recognition, you also have recognition if it's really that person that tries to log into the system. So we have an is identical and a confidence between two photos. So that way you can build systems that people can look into a camera and unlock your, your phone. Or uh, we already have that in all the phones, or unlock your laptop. But we have W3C APIs or standardized APIs now to access these systems and use it in your products to allow for facial recognition or finger recognition. Same with finger recognition. Every finger recognition that is good also realizes that there's a pulse in the finger because otherwise you could just take a, 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 a sticky tape and take somebody's fingerprint and put on a fingerprint reader as well. The biggest problem in the W3C standardizing this is that everybody has their own hardware and everybody has patents on it, so we actually cannot talk about it. That's really frustrating, but what can you do? <laughs> So allowing, uh, uh, recognizing picture, uh, pictures of people protects the end user as well. I'm not a fan of Uber. I'm a fan of the service. I'm not a fan of the company at all, the way they actually give themselves publicly. But we worked with Uber on a system that uh, makes sure that when, a dri uh, when uh, somebody is not sure if it's the real driver coming, they can actually, uh, uh, they can actually ask the driver to take a, a selfie at that moment and uses this API to verify that it's really the driver that they called and not somebody else pretending that that's their driver. So that makes everybody safer and that's actually a nice way of, of using that kind of information. And last but very much of these, uh, we have to protect our end users by short, uh, some things should not be seen by humans. <laughs> <laughs> there is a, a, there is a, there's uh, moderation APIs in all of these clustering services and all of these uh, artificial intelligence services. Facebook has them, Google has them, we have them. Ours is called moderation API because our data scientists are not that creative when it comes to naming things. But this is great because you don't want to be in, uh, in trouble with the law because somebody uploaded something to your website. Now, as soon as you put an, uh, a service there that uploads random stuff, People will put like all kind of illegal things and terrible things very, very quickly there. So you don't want to be the person that shows that and you actually have to say why it's there. But more importantly, you don't want to be the person that has to see it and delete it and report it. Being in moderation in YouTube or video services or Yahoo services back then when I worked there is not a nice job. Once you saw the fifth beheading video in a day, you don't go back to the pub and be a happy person. Humans should not have to see this kind of crap. And as it is a, a pattern that a computer can recognize, we can actually filter out things before humans actually ever have to see them. We have a data set together with 12 other companies that has a, a hash of uh, child pornography pictures on the internet. So as soon as they get uploaded, they get deleted automatically and nobody has to report them anymore because you don't want to see this. 
And the law actually means once you saw it, you actually consumed it. So you have to actually uh, make sure that you didn't do it on, I don't know, you get basically in trouble with the police just by reporting child pornography. So a computer seeing that and filtering and deleting that for you is a very, very important thing to do. And an image uh, analysis uh, API telling you that something is racy, telling you that something is about <coughs> content, you probably don't want to show that when your clients are in the Emirates or something like that because you still want to sell products there in the end. So thinking about content getting an automatically deleted before it goes on the web by humans not having to say that it's actually horrible as it is, that's a great way of thinking to use these machine learning systems in the future because computers don't get frustrated no matter what, uh, what Westwell told you. <laughs> but it's an interesting point to think about that this is the last defense that we could use computers for because we should do funny things. We should work with kittens and, and dog pictures and make painting things and make mistakes and get computers fit, fill in the mistakes for us. So think about using these systems to automate the things you don't want to do.